Section 21 of Junior Classics, Volume 4, Heroes and Heroines of Chivalry. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Junior Classics, Volume 4, Heroes and Heroines of Chivalry, by William Patton. The Mabinogian, Part 6, How Manawedon Caught a Thief. Puel and Rhiannon had a son, whom they named Prideri. And when he was grown up, Puel his father died, and Prideri married Kikva, the daughter of Gwyn Gloy. Now Manawedon returned from the war in Ireland, and he found that his cousin had seized all his possessions, and much grief and heaviness came upon him. Alas, woe is me, he exclaimed. There is none save myself without a home and a resting place. Lord, said Prideri, be not so sorrowful. Thy cousin is king of the island of the mighty, and though he has done thee wrong, thou hast never been a claimant of land or possessions. Yea, answered he, but although this man is my cousin, it grieveth me to see any one in the place of my brother, Bendegid Vran. Neither can I be happy in the same dwelling with him. Wilt thou follow the counsel of another? said Prideri. I stand in need of counsel, he answered. And what may that counsel be? Seven cantrives belong unto me, said Prideri, wherein Rhiannon my mother dwells. I will bestow her upon thee, and the seven cantrives with her. And though thou hadst no possession but those cantrives only, thou couldst not have any fairer than they. Do thou and Rhiannon enjoy them, and if thou desire any possessions, thou wilt not despise these. I do not, chieftain, said he. Heaven reward thee for thy friendship. I will go with thee to seek Rhiannon, and look to thy possessions. Thou wilt do well, he answered, and I believe that thou didst never hear a lady discourse better than she and when she was in her prime, none was ever fairer. Even now her aspect is not uncomely. They set forth, and however long the journey, they came at last to David, and a feast was prepared for them by Rhiannon and Kikva. Then began Manawedon and Rhiannon to sit and to talk together, and his mind and his thoughts became warm towards her, and he thought in his heart he had never beheld any lady more fulfilled of grace and beauty than she. Prideri, said he, I will that it be as thou didst say. What saying was that? asked Rhiannon. Lady, said Prideri, I did offer thee as a wife to Manawedon. By that will I gladly abide, said Rhiannon. Right glad am I also, said Manawedon. May heaven reward him who has shown unto me friendship so perfect as this. And before the feast was over she became his bride. Tarry ye here the rest of the feast, and I will go into England, to tender my homage unto Caswallon, the son of Beli, said Prideri. Lord, said Rhiannon, Caswallon is in Kent. Thou mayst therefore tarry at the feast, and wait until he shall be nearer. We will wait, he answered. So they finished the feast, and they began to make the circuit of David, and to hunt, and to take their pleasure. And as they went through the country, they had never seen lands more pleasant to live in, nor better hunting grounds nor greater plenty of honey and fish. And such was the friendship between these four, that they would not be parted from each other, by night nor by day. In the midst of all this, he went to Caswallon at Oxford, and tendered his homage, and honorable was his reception there, and highly was he praised for offering his homage. After his return, Prideri and Manawedon began a feast at Narberth, for it was the chief palace, when they had ended the first meal, while those who served them ate, they arose and went to the mound of Narberth, with a retinue with them. As they sat there, behold a peal of thunder, and with the violence of the thunderstorm, lo, there came a fall of mist, so thick that not one of them could see the other. And after the mist it became light all around. When they looked towards the place where they were wont to see the cattle and herds and dwellings, they saw nothing now, neither house, nor beast, nor smoke, nor fire, nor man, nor dwelling, but the buildings of the court empty and uninhabited, without either man or beast within them. In the name of heaven, said Manawedon, where are they of the court, and all my host beside? Let us go and see. So they came to the castle, and saw no man, and into the hall, and to the sleeping place, and there was none, and in the mead cellar, and in the kitchen, there was naught but desolation. Then they began to go through the land, and all the possessions that they had, and they visited the houses and dwellings, 
and found nothing but wild beasts. And when they had consumed their feast, and all their provisions, they fell upon the prey they killed in hunting. One morning, Predri and Manaweedon ranged their dogs and went forth to hunt. Some of the dogs ran before them, and came to a bush which was near at hand. But as soon as they were come to the bush, they hastily drew back, and returned to the men, their hair bristling up greatly. "'Let us go,' said Predri, "'and see what is in it.' As they came near, behold, a wild boar of a pure white color rose up from the bush. Then the dogs, being set on by the men, rushed towards him. But he left the bush, and fell back a little way from the men, and made a stand against the dogs, until the men had come near. When the men came up, he fell back a second time, and betook him to flight. They pursued the boar until they beheld a vast and lofty castle, all newly built, in a place where they had never before seen either stone or building. And the boar ran swiftly into the castle, the dogs after him. The men began to wonder at finding a castle in a place where they had never before seen any building, and listened for the dogs. But they heard not one of the dogs, nor aught concerning them. Lord, said Predri, I will go into the castle to get tidings of the dogs. Truly, he replied, if thou wouldst follow my counsel, thou wouldst not enter therein. Whosoever has cast a spell over this land has caused this castle to be here. Of a truth, answered Predri, I cannot thus give up my dogs. And to the castle he went. When he came within the castle, he found neither man nor beast, nor boar, nor dogs, nor house, nor dwelling within it. In the center of the castle floor he beheld a fountain, with marble work around it, and on the margin of the fountain a golden bowl upon a marble slab, and chains hanging from the air, to which he saw no end. He was greatly pleased with the beauty of the gold, and with the rich workmanship of the bowl. And he went up to the bowl, and laid hold of it. And when he had taken hold of it, his hands stuck to the bowl, and his feet to the slab on which the bowl was placed, and all his joyousness forsook him, so that he could not utter a word. And thus he stood. Manaweedon waited for him till near the close of the day. Late in the evening, being certain that he should have no tidings of Predri or the dogs, he went back to the palace. As he entered, Rhiannon looked at him. Where, said she, are thy companion and the dogs? Behold, he answered, the adventure that has befallen me. And he related it all unto her. An evil companion hast thou been, said Rhiannon, and a good companion hast thou lost. And with that word she went out and proceeded towards the castle, according to the direction which he gave her. The gate of the castle she found open. She was nothing daunted, and went in. As she went in, she perceived Predri laying hold of the bowl, and she went towards him. "'O oh, my lord,' said she, "'what dost thou here?' She took hold of the bowl with him, and as she did so, her hands also became fast to the bowl, and her feet to the slab, and she was not able to utter a word." and with that, as it became night, lo, there came thunder upon them, and a fall of mist, and thereupon the castle vanished, and they with it. When Kikva saw that there was no one in the palace but herself and Manaweedon, she sorrowed so that she cared not whether she lived or died. And Manaweedon saw this. Thou art in the wrong, said he. If through fear of me thou grievest thus, I call heaven to witness that thou hast never seen friendship more pure than that which I will bear thee. But it is not fitting for us to stay here. We have lost our dogs, and cannot get food. Let us go into England. It is easiest for us to find support there. Gladly, Lord, said she, we will do so. And they set forth together to England. Lord, said she, what craft wilt thou follow? Take up one that is seemly. None other will I take, answered he, but that of making shoes. Lord, said she, such a craft becomes not a man so nobly born as thou. By that, however, will I abide, said he. I know nothing thereof, said Kikva. But I know, answered Manaweedon, and I will teach thee to stitch. We will not attempt to dress the leather, but we will buy it ready dressed, and will make the shoes from it. So they went into England, and went as far as Hereford, and they betook themselves to making shoes. He began by buying the best cordwain that could be had in the town. 
and associated himself with the best goldsmith in the town, and caused him to make clasps for the shoes, and to gild the clasps, and he marked how it was done until he learned the method. When they could be had from him, not a shoe nor hose was bought of any of the cordwainers in the town. When the cordwainers perceived that their gains were failing, they came together and took counsel, and agreed that they would slay them. And he had warning thereof, and it was told him how the cordwainers had agreed together to slay him. Lord, said Kikva, wherefore should this be born from these boars? Nay, said he, we will go back to David. So towards David they set forth. Now Manawedon, when he set out to return to David, took with him a burden of wheat, and he proceeded towards Narberth, and there he dwelt. Never was he better pleased than when he saw Narberth again, and the lands where he had been wont to hunt with Predary and with Rhiannon. And he accustomed himself to fish, and to hunt for deer in their covert. He began to prepare some ground, and he sowed a croft, and a second, and a third. And no wheat in the world ever sprung up better. The three crofts prospered with perfect growth, and no man ever saw a fairer wheat. Thus passed the seasons of the year until the harvest came. And he went to look at one of his crofts, and behold, it was ripe. I will reap this tomorrow, said he. On the morrow, when he came there, he found nothing but the bare straw. Every one of the ears of the wheat was cut off from the stalk, and all the ears carried entirely away, and at this he marveled greatly. Then he went to look at another croft, and behold, that also was ripe. Verily, said he, this will I reap tomorrow. And on the morrow he came with the intent to reap it, but when he came there, he found nothing but the bare straw. "'Oh, gracious heaven!' he exclaimed. "'I know that whosoever has begun my ruin is completing it, "'and has also destroyed the country with me.' "'Then he went to look at the third croft, "'and when he came there, finer wheat had there never been seen, "'and this also was ripe. "'Evil betide me,' said he, "'if I watch not here to-night. "'Whoever carried off the other corn "'will come in like manner to take this, "'and I will know who it is.' "'And he told Kikva all that had befallen.' Verily, said she, what thinkest thou to do? I will watch the croft to-night, said he. And he went to watch the croft. At midnight he heard something stirring among the wheat, and he looked. And behold, the mightiest host of mice in the world, which could neither be numbered nor measured. He knew not what it was until the mice had made their way into the croft, and each of them, climbing up the straw, and bending it down with its weight, had cut off one of the ears of wheat, and had carried it away, leaving there the stalk, and he saw not a single straw there that had not a mouse to it. And they all took their way, carrying the ears with them. And wrath and anger did he rush upon the mice, but he could no more come up with them than if they had been gnats or birds of the air, except one only, which, though it was but sluggish, went so fast that a man on foot could scarce overtake it. After this one he went, and he caught it, and put it in his glove, and tied up the opening of the glove with a string, and kept it with him, and returned to the palace. Then he came to the hall, where Kikva was, and he lighted a fire, and hung the glove by the string upon a peg. "'What hast thou there, lord?' said Kikva. "'A thief,' said he, "'that I found robbing me. "'What kind of a thief may it be, lord, "'that thou couldst put into thy glove?' said she." Then he told her how the mice came to the last of the fields in his sight. And one of them was less nimble than the rest, and is now in my glove. Tomorrow I will hang it. My lord, said she, this is marvellous, but yet it would be unseemly for a man of dignity like thee to be hanging such a reptile as this. Woe betide me, said he, if I would not hang them all, could I catch them, and such as I have I will hang. Verily, lord, said she, there is no reason that I should succor this reptile, except to prevent discredit unto thee. Do therefore, Lord, as thou wilt. Then he went to the mound of Narberth, taking the mouse with him. He set up two forks on the highest part of the mound, and while he was doing this he saw a scholar coming towards him, and old and tattered garments. It was seven years since he had seen in that place either man or beast, except those four persons who had remained together 
until two of them were lost. "'My lord,' said the scholar, "'good day to thee. "'Heaven prosper thee, and my greeting be unto thee. "'And whence dost thou come, scholar?' asked he. "'I come, lord, from singing in England. "'And wherefore dost thou inquire?' "'Because for the last seven years,' answered he, "'I have seen no man here save four secluded persons, "'and thyself this moment.' "'Truly, Lord,' said he, "'I go through this land unto mine own. "'And what work art thou upon, Lord?' "'I am hanging a thief that I caught robbing me,' said he. "'What manner of thief is that?' asked the scholar. "'I see a creature in thy hand like unto a mouse, "'and ill does it become a man of rank equal to thine, "'to touch a reptile such as this. "'Let it go forth free.' "'I will not let it go free by heaven,' said he. "'I caught it robbing me.' and the doom of a thief will I inflict upon it, and I will hang it. Lord, said he, rather than see a man of rank equal to thine at such a work as this, I would give thee a pound, which I have received as alms, to let the reptile go forth free. I will not let it go free, said he, neither will I sell it. As thou wilt, Lord, he answered, I care not. And the scholar went his way. As he was placing the cross-beam upon the two forks, Behold, a priest came towards him, upon a horse covered with trappings. "'Good day to thee, Lord,' said he. "'Heaven prosper thee,' said Manaweden, "'thy blessing. "'The blessings of heaven be upon thee. "'And what, Lord, art thou doing?' "'I am hanging a thief that I caught robbing me.' "'What manner of thief, Lord?' asked he. "'A creature,' he answered, "'in the form of a mouse. "'It has been robbing me, "'and I am inflicting upon it the doom of a thief.' Lord, said he, rather than see thee touch this reptile, I would purchase its freedom. By my confession to heaven, neither will I sell it, nor set it free. It is true, Lord, that it is worth nothing to buy, but rather than see thee defile thyself, by touching such a reptile as this, I will give thee three pounds to let it go. I will not, by heaven, said he, take any price for it. As it ought, so shall it be hanged. And the priest went his way. Then he noosed the string around the mouse's neck, and as he was about to draw it up, behold, he saw a bishop's retinue with his sumpter horses and his attendants. The bishop himself came towards him, and he stayed his work. Lord Bishop, said he, thy blessing. Heaven's blessings be unto thee, said he. What work art thou upon? Hanging a thief that I caught robbing me, said he. Is not that a mouse that I see in thy hand? Yes, answered he, and she has robbed me. I said he, since I have come at the doom of this reptile, I will ransom it of thee. I will give thee seven pounds for it, and that rather than see a man of rank equal to thine, destroying so vile a reptile as this. Let it loose, and thou shalt have the money. I declare to heaven that I will not let it loose. If thou wilt not loose it for this, I will give thee four and twenty pounds of ready money to set it free. I will not set it free by heaven for as much again, said he. If thou wilt not set it free for this, I will give thee all the horses that thou seest in this plain, and the seven loads of baggage, and the seven horses that they are upon. By heaven I will not, he replied, since for this thou wilt not set it free, do so at what price soever thou wilt. I will that Rhiannon and Pretory be free, said he. That thou shalt have, he answered. Not yet will I loose the mouse by heaven. What then wouldst thou? that the charms and the illusion be removed from the seven cantrips of David. This thou shalt have also, set therefore the mouse free. I will not set it free by heaven, said he, till I know who the mouse may be. She is my wife. Wherefore came she to me? To despoil thee, he answered. I am Lloyd, the son of Kilwid, and I cast a charm over the seven cantrips of David. And it was to avenge Gaul, the son of Clude, from the friendship I had towards him, that I cast the charm. And upon Pretory did I avenge Gaul, the son of Clude, for the game of Badger in the bag, that Puyol, the son of Alwyn, played upon him. And when it was known that thou wouldst come to dwell in the land, my household came and besought me to transform them into mice, that they might destroy thy corn. They went the first and the second night, and destroyed thy two crofts. The third night my wife came unto me, and the ladies of the court, and besought me to transform them. And I transformed them. Now my wife was not in her usual health, 
for had she been in her usual health, thou wouldst not have been able to overtake her. But since this has taken place, and she has been caught, I will restore to thee Pretory and Rhiannon, and I will take the charm and delusion from off David. Set her therefore free. I will not set her free yet. What wilt thou more? he asked. I will that there be no more charm upon the seven cantrips of David, and that none shall be put upon it henceforth. Moreover, that vengeance be never taken for this, either upon Pretory or Rhiannon, or upon me. All this shalt thou have, and truly thou hast done wise in asking this. Upon thy head would have lit all this trouble. Yea, said he, for fear thereof was it that I required this. Set now my wife at liberty. I will not, said he, until I see Pretory and Rhiannon with me free. Behold, here they come, he answered, and thereupon he beheld Pretory and Rhiannon. He rose up to meet them, and greeted them, and sat down beside them. Ah, oh, chieftain, set now my wife at liberty, said the bishop. Hast thou not received all thou didst ask? I will release her gladly, said he. And thereupon he set her free. Then he struck her with a magic wand, and she was changed back into a young woman, the fairest ever seen. Look round upon thy land, said he, and thou wilt see it all tilled, and peopled as it was in its best estate. And he rose up and looked forth, and when he looked he saw all the lands tilled, and full of herds and dwellings. End of section 21